Holy Gospel according to St. John, 6th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, <clears throat> the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. What are they among so many people? Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now, there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. And they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. A wealth of riches in today's readings. Um, all of them. Wondering if, if you were all aware that there were feeding stories in the Old Testament. That Jesus is not the only one that multiplied the loaves. First time I read that, I was surprised by it. But we get it every couple of years in our lectionary texts. But um, it is a precursor to obviously what Jesus was doing. And that a passage from Ephesians, an amazing, beautiful, beautiful prayer uh, by the author of that book. Just the description of, of our Lord and the encouragement that we might, by some miracle of the Spirit come to understand the breadth and the width and the height and the depth of the love of God that we have in Jesus Christ. And then John's version of the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, this miracle story is, I believe, the only one that is common to all the Gospels. And they each tell a slightly different version of it. And just, you know, for fun, we, we get six weeks of bread stories from this chapter of John's Gospel, which you should not envy me to preach six, well, five, because I won't be preaching on this one next week. I'll leave that up to Jeremy. But five sermons about bread and Jesus being the bread of life. In the process of thinking about, again, the riches of these texts and how it struck me, it just kind of fell upon me that there's a lot of nuggets in these stories, but 
the limitless, limitlessness of God is very much part of all of these stories. Can we all agree that God is limitless? Then why do we limit God? Is that not our nature? And in those stories, at least certainly from 2 Kings and the Gospel, there are people in those stories that very much think God is limited. Now, a lack of understanding is, uh, is understandable because nobody would have expected Jesus to be the God that he is. Um, and um, Elisha was a prophet that did many miracles. Read that fourth chapter of 2 Kings. It's all, many of the miracles he did. He was the miracle prophet. Um, but that was something that nobody would have expected to happen. Um, so, so it makes sense. But they play the foil to the limitlessness of God. Two of the disciples thought Jesus was crazy. One of them a little less than the other. Well, what are we going to do with five, you know, where are we going to get the money to pay for the bread for all these people, food for all these people? And the second disciple, Philip, comes in and says, well, there's a kid here that's got some bread and fish. What are you, an idiot? I mean, come on, how are we going to feed 5,000 people with that? There was some hope there, but I love the part in John's Gospel John portrays Jesus a little differently than the other three Gospels, that Jesus knew in his mind what he was going to do. And he was tested by asking that question. Um, just that sort of inner smirk that he must have had at that comment. And Let me show you what I'm going to do. Because God is the God who shows us. And throughout scriptures, we see how limitless he is from the very beginning to the very end. God is infinite in his power, and in his wisdom, and in his authority, and in his justice, and in so many ways, as the writer of Ephesians said, beyond our knowledge. It's impossible for us to know. And I, and I say this often to remind me, and to remind you all that we shouldn't try to put God in a box. Because there is no limit to what God can do. Our struggle is in what he actually does do. And again, not the way that we would like him to do things. Nevertheless, there is no limit. Thinking about that passage from Ephesians. And initially, on reading that, I think about myself. I think that the writer is talking to me about me, wanting me to understand the breadth and the height and the depth and the width and all of that of God's love for me, right? Did you hear that as well? Did you think of yourselves in that, do any of you struggle with your value or worth, your self-esteem, thinking that you're worthy of that kind of extravagant love, thinking that there are things that you have to do in order to receive God's love, or things that you could do more of to get more of God's love, or to keep him from loving you less. Perhaps not consciously, but subconsciously don't, maybe a little bit, don't we kind of do that? I mean, at the very least, I struggle with that idea and that sense of my value and worth. I, I was blessed again to hear um, from Denise's family as I was with them on Wednesday in the hospital and just, you know, like, I shared some things about Denise with 
her family and, and with them and just, you know, one of them said, you have no idea what a difference that you made. Not just in the recent past with what she was experiencing, but I have regularly gone and visited with her. Um, loving almost every minute of it, except her dog. <laughs> <laughs> Oreo was a high energy little dog <laughs> who loved to climb on me. Her son-in-law, Rick, said after I made that comment to them, Oh, you're not going to want to know what's in the will. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Um, <laughs> and I don't do those visits because I think I'm making a difference. I do those visits for other reasons. Um, but I don't ever leave thinking, wow, that was a difference that I made. But to get back to my original point on that, it, I heard it, but did I receive it? And maybe that's a good thing, but that is that last part of Ephesians where God can do far more than we can even think or imagine. And it is a reminder to me that, yes, he can. Even through someone like me who doesn't believe those things or puts limits on what God can do, that he can work and do amazing things from us, from just the simplest things. If we're rooted and grounded in his love, like again, the author of Ephesians wrote, the secret of that is being rooted and grounded in that love so that we can... live in the reality of our worth and value, not coming from the things that we do or our titles or our wealth or anything else other than just God's limitless love for us. I can't wrap my head around that fully, but I need those reminders on a regular and constant basis. And I hope you receive those here because that's a big, big part of the gospel is that Christ died for us not because we are worthy of it, not because we deserved it, not because we can do things to earn that or ever pay God back or reward him with anything that we have to offer that's going to justify us or give us the ability to justify the things that we do that aren't so great by saying, well, I do all these great things because that's not how it works. It's simply just a matter of the grace of God given to us without limit. But then there's the so that. I hear that Ephesians passage and I think of myself, but do I think about how that applies to everybody else? Because if God has that kind of love for me without height or depth or width or breadth or anything else, he, he has it for you also. And, and, and you and you and you and, and the people outside of this building. Everywhere. All of them. Not a single one. Not a single person. Is that withheld from by God? Not one. That's the extraordinary thing of it. When Jesus told the disciples to have the 5,000 sit down, he didn't pass out a survey. Tell me your ethnicity. Tell me how much money you have. What church do you go to? What language do you speak? What is your orientation? What is your belief? Have all of them sit down. And then you think about the stories of how Jesus lived his life and where that he went and the things that he did. The Syrophoenician woman, the Samaritans, the Romans. 
the lepers, the prostitutes, the tax collectors. How many stories do we read about people that we would deem worthy of that kind of limitless love being on the receiving end of it? I'm waiting. <laughs> Lots. Right. There's purpose in those stories. There's reason why those characters are the ones that are in the stories. 5,000 people. Do you not think there was a, not a single wacko in that group? <laughs> like just one that everyone else pointed to and went, no, that one's crazy. What is, what is he or she doing here? I've heard the things that they've said or done. I know that person. No, sit down. Because the reality is every one of us human beings, regardless of anything, we have a hunger that is, we're unable to satiate ourselves. That it's only something that a limitless God can do. And being rooted and grounded in his love allows us the freedom to be limitless in the way that we love also. To look at certain kinds and groups of people to see what the height and the depth and the breadth and the width of God's love is for that person. Uh, in one of my visits this week with Vicki, thank you Vicki for always being my companion in those visits. It means the world to me, too, that you join me in those things. Sorry. Believe that. It's true. <laughs> Someone asked me a, one of those ethical, moral conundrum questions about a particular group of people or a person, and it was like, what do you think? And, and I don't have a good answer for the question. It's because it's an impossible question to answer. But what I think is at the heart of that is though, and it's not because this is a bad person, but it's because of sin that lives with each and every one of us. We want to identify those people where we can say that doesn't apply to them. That I could possibly affirm what that person was believing to say, you're right in thinking that that particular brand or label of people or persons are not within the scope of the height and depth and breadth and width of a God that can do more than we could possibly think or imagine. And I do that all the time. And I'm wondering if you've ever had that experience to think, oh gosh, there is a limit. Not necessarily consciously, but subconsciously. We love the limitless nature of God's grace when it applies to us. Do we not? I do. But because I think of myself as special or better, for whatever reason, I know it is. It's that three-letter word that we just can't separate or detach ourselves from. So we need to be reminded. Yes, we need to be reminded of our value and worth because of what Christ has done for us. But we also need to be reminded of the value and worth that everybody else has in God's eyes. That's our charge as Christians. That's our charge as followers. That's our charge as disciples in this world. To not just see ourselves, to not just by the power of the Spirit know beyond or as much as we can how much we are loved, but to see in the world and the rest of the world the same thing. And that's hard. I get it. Especially today in the world that we live in. It's even harder. Because the voices of those that want to marginalize and push out and 
sermon for a different day. I hope and I pray the same for all of you, that you do know by the power of the Spirit what is truly the height and width and depth and length is of the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus for you, but not only for you, but for all people. Thank you.